many years later, Austria and Ireland are still neutral, but we have other things to worry about, such as the Euro crisis, uh, which is the, the part of the topic of, of, of my uh, statement today here. And now, before I actually go into the substance of that, I would uh, say something about the rather peculiar nature of European foreign policy. Uh, you know, every single one of you knows that, of course, uh, security concerns were at the very origins of the, uh, of the integration process, but later on the whole dynamism came from uh, the economic side, and foreign policy made its reappearance only in the early 70s, and remained for a long time a sideshow, and you could say it still remains a sideshow uh, of the European integration process as a whole. Uh, the member states share uh, a common market, uh, many of them share a common currency, uh, many of them share the Schengen space, uh, many of, all of them share a very rich and very heavy legislative acquis, Many of these aspects have their own external implications, such as trade policy, visa policy, international environmental policies. And on top of this elaborate construction of deep integration, you have something that resembles very much uh, traditional intergovernmental organizations, such as the Council of Europe or the OSE. You have CFSP. It's sort of superimposed on, on something that goes way beyond uh, a traditional uh, intergovernmental inter organization. And that, I think, explains sort of the schizophrenic aspect of, of CFSP, that on the one hand, it benefits from the identity building effect of the much stronger integration in other areas, which means that uh, external partners of the EU and also many European citizens would expect something uh, at the level of the overall relevance of the European Union. Uh, but at the same time, CFSP is in a way the weakest link in the chain of EU activities. And for that reason, many of the expect these expectations are frequently um, disappointed. Now, um, the reason why I, I briefly described this sort of outlook on CFSP in general is that I, I really believe uh, it's quite fundamental to, to keep in mind always uh, that it is the economic integration, the integration of Europe that drives the foreign policy dimension. Uh, I read recently a, a paper by a very uh, good colleague of mine, whose work I admire very much, but basically he said now, with the Euro crisis and all this mess and all these difficulties, why don't we shift our efforts really to foreign and security policy, really try to uh, improve things in this area and, so, and re-energize the European project by this means. Uh, I think this is absolutely not an option. This is simply not possible. If the Eurozone is uh, in crisis, so is European foreign policy. If the crisis is eventually resolved, and I very much hope it will be, uh, European foreign policy will once again uh, become more relevant. Uh, uh, but there is clearly the driver is always the integration process as such, and, and foreign policy is one of the uh, elements that are moved by the dynamism in, in this economic and other areas. Now I come to the ways in which the Euro crisis affects uh, European foreign policy. And I must say, I must warn you, what you are going to hear now is fairly depressing. <laughs> but I'll keep it short and really highlight only the most important parts of it. The, the one, uh, maybe even the biggest uh, effect uh, that is frequently not overlooked but underestimated is distraction. If you look, for instance, at the year 2011, uh, the year 2011 was as rich and as uh, loaded with big international developments as the year 1989. You know, it's, it's unique. Everything changed in the Arab world. These are very, very far-reaching and profound uh, transformations. In normal times, you would have expected the European Council to meet many times on these issues. Uh, you would have expected the president of the European Council to take, make missions here and there, to engage in diplomacy, to sort things out. In 2011, as you know, the European Council met every few weeks, but it only had one really substantive discussion, operational discussion on, on these issues that was on Libya, I think, in March 2011. 
Uh, otherwise, this was simply not happening because the uh, EU, in a way, was at war with the bond markets. And at times of war, most other things get neglected. Now, you might say, okay, uh, there are also foreign ministers, and it's a fact, of course, that the Foreign Affairs Council discussed all these matters at great length. But uh, unfortunately, the dynamics of European foreign policy has changed. Uh, the foreign ministers in the last uh, 15, 20 years lost a lot of their role. They lost it to the line ministries, but in particular, they lost it to the heads of states and government in most of these countries. And this is one of the paradoxes of the present situation, that now that the bosses really have all the authority and power for foreign policy, they have no time to use that. So uh, this explains to some extent why, why the European Council was, well, it continues to be fairly, fairly inactive on a very rich uh, external agenda. The second point is the loss of ambition. And this is, uh, I mean, this is a simple uh, psychological mechanism. If you have a big internal crisis, the will, power, and the confidence that you can influence outside event uh, reduces, is, is rapidly reduced. Uh, this has happened before in European integration. To some extent, this is just a reordering of priorities. You put your own house in order first before you deal with other matters. But I think in this case, it goes beyond that. It is really sort of a question of self-doubt and it's a fundamental crisis of confidence that uh, many uh, uh, people in responsibility experience in Europe these days. Uh, the third point is loss of prestige and soft power. That's the flip side of the loss of confidence. Uh, and it's, 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 it's uh, undoubtedly true that the Euro crisis has resulted in a huge uh, loss of soft power. The Europe is no longer perceived in many places as part of the solution of problems, but it's seen as a big problem in, in its own right. Uh, I've been told by a colleague who participated in the EU Ambassadors Conference uh, in, in Brussels a few weeks ago, uh, who reported that many of his colleagues said that basically <laughs> most of their conversations uh, in the countries where they uh, serve are completely dominated by concern about the Europe crisis. Uh, and, and they keep having to explain uh, the various uh, efforts to manage the crisis, and this is completely dominating their role at the same time, at the present time. Now, I've been to Belgrade uh, two weeks ago, and my impression from talking to people with whom I've worked for many years is that, of course, the Euro crisis has also reduced our leverage and our influence on the countries of the Balkans. Uh, uh, they look at Greece, and suddenly the perspective of EU membership looks rather different from what it used to. Uh, I've read something quite hilarious, uh, an interview with the Croatian after the Croatian referendum, which was uh, very strongly positive, of course. But he said that uh, for Croatia, Croatia, joining the European Union now is a bit like arriving very late at a party when uh, all the, uh, <laughs> half the people are drunk and half are on the way. <laughs> so that is, this clearly, that uh, is, 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 is the case, unfortunately, that uh, the, both the reality of, of, of the promise to join has lost credibility, and also the attractiveness of this perspective uh, is also suffering. I think these countries still are where they are. They have no strategic alternative. They maintain on the course, but their, their confidence and energy in which they pursue the agenda is not what it used to be. Now, uh, but this effect does not only affect the European neighborhood. A friend from the EAS told me that he recently went to Pacific Islands, very, very far away. And he was shocked by the amount of commiseration he had to listen to <laughs> and concern about the future of the European Union. <laughs> and that was, of course, also mixed with concerns about the continuation of, of, of assistance. Now, uh, uh, there is, of course, one uh, collateral benefit from all this misery is that uh, because of the crisis, the interest in Europe has increased again. Uh, it's interesting that uh, GMF, uh, German Marshall Fund, does polling every year on the transatlantic trends. And, and the 2012 polling uh, had 55% of Americans 
believing that Europe was more important to the US than Asia. In 2011, it was still the other way around. So you can be relevant and significant also when you have a problem, not just when you have something that is particularly useful. The fourth point uh, is fairly trivial but very important, is the lack of resources. Uh, foreign policy costs money. Less money means less foreign policy. Uh, the resource constraints uh, in Brussels uh, and in the member states explain why the CSDP operations uh, over the last years have been uh, diminishing radically, the new ones. Uh, there are many of the old ones continuing, some of them with very severe resource and manning constraints and many problems. Uh, uh, because simply there is, in many countries, not the money there to, to, to mobilize uh, the resources uh, for uh, missions that are seen as less important than uh, having these people, policemen, serving in your own country. Uh, also, of course, uh, financial constraints are part of the reason why the External Action Service was not implemented in a way which really exploited the full potential that was foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty. If you look at the number of people that the rotating presidency used to <laughs> use in foreign policy, uh, if you take this into account, then the overall number of people that work on foreign policy now in Brussels uh, and in the delegations is, is about the same as the number working on this issue during the Solana's time. Even though, of course, the new treaty has involved uh, considerable additional tasks. And, and what you hear at the moment is, I think, uh, the Council has frozen the ES budget. It now depends on the process whether the Parliament uh, helps reopening it again. But the situation is, is, is quite serious and the ES might be in the unfortunate situation of having to look at cutting the network and actually reducing the overall manpower simply because of financial constraints. I do hope it will not get that far, but it is uh, clearly a very difficult uh, moment. The fifth point, and I'm approaching the end of the list, uh, then it will be more uplifting again, I hope, uh, is the loss of coherence. Uh, I think as a result of the crisis, you have centrifugal forces at work in the EU. Uh, if you, there is this publication, annual publication, the ESCFR scorecard, and they speak about the renationalization trend, creeping renationalization of European foreign policy. Uh, it is, uh, I think, obvious that uh, the Euro crisis also produces a lot of new divisions between North and South, between ins and outs. Uh, it also affects the confidence and the solidarity among member states. And I think it can be shown uh, that it's sort of anecdotal in, uh, uh, evidence rather than sort of something that is really statistically researched. But I think the overall coherence of the EU has gone down in recent years. There's a greater readiness of individual countries to take their own national positions in, without coordination. Uh, there is a lack of less investment in the common project in, uh, in European foreign policy. Uh, and there is also, I think, a greater readiness to use national interests to block EU positions within the institutions. All this is not, you know, dramatic. And it's, uh, it is, uh, you know, what we used to have was not so terribly strong and efficient, but uh, it is, the trend is clearly uh, in the wrong direction. Now, all these consequences are, are serious and they are problematic, but they are not tragic at this point. Uh, I think they amount to the relative weakening of a foreign policy instrument that was never very strong. And they can easily be reversed if the euro crisis can be overcome. And this brings me to the, I think, more interesting, uh, but also highly speculative part of my presentation, the scenarios for the future. Now, the first scenario would assume that the euro crisis cannot be resolved. Uh, either the, the eurozone breaks up, or this kind of dancing on the brink of disaster continues for a number of additional years. Under these circumstances, I think all these negative trends will, will continue uh, and will result in a much more fragmented Europe. Uh, the bigger countries uh, will continue to play a significant role. 
but it's particularly smaller countries that will lose part of their voice in international affairs. Uh, cooperation among the big countries, if it takes place, might take uh, place outside the EU institutions in many cases. Uh, and it could well be that sort of coalitions of the willing will be the normal way of, of, of dealing with European foreign policy challenges. Uh, the kind of attractive force of the EU that has a very important stabilizing influence uh, in the Balkans, in Eastern Europe, uh, and even beyond, will diminish, uh, which would mean that this would benefit the nationalist parties and forces in these countries and could threaten uh, uh, the, uh, the stability in the region as a whole. And of course, the chances and the possibilities to affect changes in the Arab world and beyond to participate in, in global decisions uh, on, on global uh, future uh, orientations uh, will, of course, also diminish greatly. Uh, if the EU manages to, to, to overcome the euro crisis, I see basically two scenarios. Uh, one would, almost certainly, I think, the consolidation of the euro would require a significant uh, deepening of integration within the eurozone, uh, banking union, fiscal union, much closer economic coordination. Uh, not all countries uh, are likely to join the euro, but it is imaginable that these countries reach some kind of a durable accommodation with the countries in the eurozone. Um, this would not result then in a, in a sort of federal Europe, but it would result in something much looser, a construction of, based on uh, policy communities uh, and variable geometry. Um, there would be several policy communities which share the internal markets, but otherwise have different rules and different participants and different degrees of, of integration. To some extent, this is just a continuation of what you already have at the moment. When you have the Eurozone, you have Schengen, you have defense policy, etc. But this would probably be much further developed. If this happens, then foreign policy will certainly be, or will likely be, one of the broadest policy communities uh, where practically everybody would participate, even though defense policy might be organized on a more narrow basis to accommodate neutral countries, <laughs> among others. Uh, uh, it could be based, for instance, on the permanent structured cooperation foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty. Um, following the Euro crisis, I would expect uh, external challenges to rise up on the agenda again. I would not believe that the structures of foreign policy making would uh, radically change. I think what could well happen, and I certainly would hope it to happen, is that the Lisbon arrangements would be implemented in a, in a more ambitious way. And this would mean, for instance, a strengthening of the political mandate of the EU High Representative uh, and a reinforcement of the European Ex Action Service uh, in terms of more resources, more engagement, more buy-in, more commitment from the Commission and from the Member States. Uh, following this trajectory, the Member States would remain international players. They would preserve their right to be, uh, you know, produce foreign policy, but probably over the years, more and more foreign policy would actually be made in the framework of, of European institutions. Now, um, how plausible is such a scenario? Uh, there are a number of, of interesting variables. Uh, one is the degree of deepening in the euro. So if this is really serious, for instance, leads to a common European treasury or a separate budget, then I would think it's almost inevitable that uh, the, there would be a core periphery relationship between the Eurozone and the rest. And if there is such a core periphery relationship, then this wonderful notion of variable geometry and various communities of policy will no longer work because uh, there would be sort of a hierarchy among member states and, and, and this construction would be more difficult to, to sustain. Another big uh, variable, important variable, is the number of participants in the Eurozone deepening. If this follows the, the model of, of the fiscal pact, uh, which means that almost all member states actually participate in deepening, even those who do not yet participate in the Eurozone, uh, the effect on, on European foreign policy would be much less 
than if the Eurozone remains a much more exclusive club. And there are quite a number of countries that are sort of left beside, uh, behind in, in an outdoor circle. Now, um, imagine, for instance, that the heads of state of governments of the Eurozone have a meeting in, in Brussels to discuss budgetary issues. And we have, would have a big international crisis breaking out. Now, the question is, are they going to wait until uh, the, the people fly in from the capitals of the non-Eurozone countries to participate in, in discussing this crisis management? Or would they discuss these issues and make statements? Uh, it's an open question. One doesn't know yet. But I, I think the, the more you have uh, uh, sort of business at the center, the more meetings you have, the more likely it is that this eventually develops also a foreign policy dimension. The third key variable, uh, maybe the most important one, is of course the UK. Uh, the British attitude to the EU is absolutely crucial. Uh, I visited London in, in July in preparing this paper, and I was impressed and actually quite shocked by the number of well-informed interlocutors who told me that uh, a referendum on EU membership uh, in the next parliament, so around 2014, is close to inevitable. Um, because they're clearly the political dynamics in the various parties uh, move in this direction. I think a uh, UK departure would have a huge impact uh, on the EU as a whole and on EU foreign policy in particular. Uh, the UK is certainly one of the strongest foreign policy players uh, in Europe. Uh, and in, in terms of the substance, of, of foreign policy making, uh, the loss of the UK contribution would be a huge loss, a huge loss. I think in the daily work, what the British diplomats bring to the table in terms of their expertise, in terms of their sort of networking resources, in terms of creativity, uh, is, is, is enormous. I think it's possibly one of the strongest countries uh, in the EU foreign policy at the moment. Uh, at the same time, of course, the UK is also a big constraint when it comes to developing the structures of European foreign policy, um, particularly in, in the area of, of, of security, but also on foreign policy in general. And also it's true that the UK already now is not 100% in. Uh, I was struck, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, when the Foreign Secretary, William Hague, gave a statement announcing a big program of, of having joint embassies in, in third countries. And uh, on the face of it, this looks really good and interesting, sort of pooling and sharing uh, in diplomacy. It's a very nice idea. But the interesting fact is, of course, that the UK is about to do this with Canada, <laughs> which I think shows this kind of semi-detached nature already now of, of, of the UK role in, in European foreign policy. Um, now, the, this brings me to the second scenario, uh, which uh, assumes that the euro crisis can only be resolved through a really massive deepening of integration in the eurozone. Uh, the transfer of fiscal and economic uh, policy competences could be so far-reaching uh, that eventually this leads to a, a genuine hard core based on the eurozone based essentially on federal uh, principles. The countries that are unwilling or for the longer term unable to participate in the Eurozone would be relegated to a second outer circle. Now, if the integration in the, in the core is sufficiently dynamic, this could have as a consequence that the outer circle finds itself increasingly marginalized. Eventually, I think, this is certainly would happen a few years later, uh, this core could develop a uh, foreign and security dimension. If the whole construction of the core by that time is almost federal in character, one would assume that also on the foreign and security policy you could have much more efficient decision-making procedures, you could have a stronger strategic vision, and you can seriously have seriously upgraded instruments. However, this gain in punch is, uh, comes at a high price because uh, presumably quite a number of countries that now participate in European foreign policy will not be, be part of this uh, construction. So I think this would necessitate to have very good 
mechanisms to associate these countries effectively to the European foreign policy making. Otherwise, you would create new divisions in Europe, which obviously nobody would want. Now, uh, I've come to the end. Uh, all this is, of course, pure speculation. It's not hard to come up with three other scenarios. Uh, for instance, uh, a friend pointed out to me that he believed that even if there is very serious deepening based on the Eurozone, uh, member states would uh, strive to maintain the room for, of maneuver and foreign policy, basically. This might be the only area left where they want to reassert their sovereignty and they, they will keep it out of the hands of Brussels bureaucrats and, 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 and keep things basically as they are. Personally, I don't think so because of the thought that I, I explained at the very beginning of this statement. I do believe that the driver of, of foreign policy making in the EU is economic integration. If this moves forward uh, rapidly and successfully, it will also give a very strong impetus to do more on the military and security side. I think what is very clear is if the Eurozone crisis cannot be resolved, uh, European foreign policy will be part of the collateral damage. If it can be resolved, uh, it is likely to be strengthened again, to be revived. But the shape and form of this revival and the participants and the sort of geometry of, of this revival is impossible to, to predict at the moment. But what seems very clear, it's likely to look very different from what we have at the moment. Thank you very much.